Ray will be, read first, and he'll be introduced by Paula Mendoza Hanna. Uh, Paula is just finishing up her MFA in poetry at the University of Michigan. She's been a volunteer for us and later an intern um, for us since she first attended our like very first event. Um, and she's stuck around, and she really believes in community arts and what we're trying to do here, and we'll totally miss her when she's gone. Um, and Audra Pachowski is a current student in the U of M MFA program, and she also said that she's into uh, Argentinian tango dancing, so poetry and tango. Um, and so without further ado, I will um, let Paula introduce Ray. Thank you. Daniel is author of Saltwater Empire and the National Poetry Series award-winning collection of poems, Murder of Violet. He writes reviews for Fences the Constant Critic and teaches at the University of Michigan. I was recommended Raymond McDaniel's first book, Murder of Violet, by my professor Keith Taylor my first year here. It was after his kind tolerance of my rambling on about how much I dig the surfaces of language. And as wise as he is kind, Keith steered me right. And reading Murder, I marveled at the glint and shimmer of these fragments out of which McDaniel so precisely constructs the story and moral dilemma of a soldier girl assassin. Stark, vivid, McDaniel's precision might seem cold or cruel if it weren't for all that warm blood coursing through his verse. The poem for a spring that tells of our heroine's first skill contains the following lines. And to extract a core of his colors and manner is as to pluck a wildflower and drink milk from its stem. Later in the poem, a reader in the aesthetic pleasure she shares with our heroine feels implicated to enjoy these lines, which may explain why she sent the steel through his throat and saw it as silver stamen, as shine. Its edges and facets entice and elude in turns, and it is a book to which one returns because it will not stop unfolding. His second collection, similarly seductive and complex, creates a music of home. This native Floridian saltwater empire is a stereophonic and orchestral performance. McDaniel's poems compose the South, speak in the voices of its inhabitants, and his language enacts that landscape's swelter, its swagger, and its weather. This collection is peopled with stories which are elegiac, which are triumphant, which are ecstatic. As in the poem Azili's Remedy for Rain, the spirit here is one that survives not by force, but bliss. McDaniel's forthcoming special powers and abilities explores the technicolor dramas of those in the Legion of Superheroes, a fictional superhero team comprised of ageless teens. In spite of, or perhaps all the more keenly amplified by this bizarre and spectacular premise, is the genuinely affecting and poignant heartaches and troubles of these characters. The sounds and noises all through this collection are brilliantly audacious, as vivid and frenetic as the lines and hues and glossy splashes of the world in which these characters exist. The poem, Brainiac 5 Models the City of Candor, begins. Terrarium and transistors plucked from the dragonfly. Map of simple circuits, last city of Krypton, proud candor. It is the work of my inculcation, near my majority. Aching walls raised and raised, blueprint from, drawn from adventure. Here, its fountain of fluid sentience, this thimble filled with cold blue dye, almost ice, its elegant intelligence. To this, intro, uh, to this introduction of this work, I want to add that I wasn't here to know the grounding force of arts and community that was Shaman Drum, and for which McDaniel worked in, as an events coordinator and host of its reading series for several, several years. He played an important role, one I'm certain not a few Ann Arborites know and thank him for. However, I am thankful to know his work and to welcome him here today for Copper Colored Mountain Arts One Pause Poetry uh, Reading Series, a new forest in the community all its own, and it seems fitting. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Raymond McDaniel. Beautiful, Paula. Thank you. 
and almost approaching true, but not, not quite. <laughs> thank you, Paula. Thank you, Audra and Sarah. Uh, it's true, I've known Sarah for 17, 18, yeah, 17, 18 years. I'm very grateful to know her still. Thank you, CCMA. Uh, thank you, Mark and Monica. They're so beautiful and so talented. They have so much to recommend themselves. I have teenage superheroes from the 30th century. <laughs> I would also like to thank my students. It's unbelievable if you are here that you are here. <laughs> so as, as Paula said, this most recent book is, will be about the Legion of Superheroes, uh, which is the longest running serial narrative in the 20th century. It involves teenage superheroes in the 30th century who have modeled their adventures on the superheroes of our present, who they actually invent a time machine to go and recruit. <laughs> so I'll begin with Superboy. Clark Kent of Earth. Kal-El of Krypton. Gosh. Artifact of the era of alter egos. Glorious, skyward, upward, away. Perfectly powerful, but ordinary, steady. Best as boyish. Country comes to town. The blessed best of us. Ignorant of sin and ignorant as. Real strong goodness. Our moral immortal. The teen of steel. So these next few poems will be likewise abbreviated descriptions of members of the Legion of Superheroes. I am not making any of these names or <laughs> powers up. I wish. Colossal Boy. <laughs> Jim Allen of Earth. Super Growth. Essentially, an officer of the law. Hugely good-natured. Wishful, wistful, bashful. What makes a good boy better? More boy. <laughs> Embiggened. A good son. A good son makes a good target. He takes up all the air in the room. Substantive, massive, major, yet reluctant to grow up. He falls hard. Duo damsel. <laughs> Disclaimer, she was once triplicate girl, but clearly something went wrong. <laughs> once a triplicate, previously primary, duplication endlessly rejects point of view. I said that. No, I said that. <laughs> Who becomes which? Fewer than deserved, even diminished, duo agrees to regret, to embargo individual, another other. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> she declenses. <laughs> she selves to defend. Light lass. She makes kites from packing cubes. Every room in her rage falls up. Presumed elevated, her attention is on respecting normal tread, all buoyancy belligerent towards gravity. What's up, light lass? Up is the direction pointing away from the center of the earth. She wants you to float away with her. Sacrifice lightning for this? Mass absent compass. When clouds float, we call them clouds. When clouds fall, we call them rain. Element lad. This is for you, Mark. <laughs> Element lad, Jan Ara of Trom, super transmutation. Lonely lad, the last. Mendicant close to magical. A joiner and a breaker. Rearranger. Memorial monk who could turn everything into everything else. No master, no mixture. Pen ultimately powerful, he sees what could be. Maker of isotope and alloy. Our Mooney ally. Infinitely transformative. Periodically divine. 
This next is Brainiac 5. I have a soft spot for Brainiac 5. He was the member of the Legion I identified with the most strongly when I was a boy. <laughs> He's lime green and has a thick shock of blonde hair and wears a purple jumpsuit <laughs> with knee-high yellow boots, much like myself. <laughs> And his only superpower is his intelligence. You can see how the kind of kid who would read the Legion of Superheroes would automatically be drawn to Brainiac 5. <laughs> Architect of Addict. Bread for reason. Your attention, like ice and addition, smug in your laboratory. De facto doctor whose equations equal etiology. Apply Socratic strategies, special intelligence, digital will. Don't you need that formula, doctor, because you never could throw anything away? Your hope, hypodermic, a flat dramatic, some quotient, hysteric. But your wits about you this once, your sense, force, your insurance. Redeem the days you've damned, your aura, your authority, your shield. You who earned admission by untouchable. Sunboy. Super Radiance. <laughs> hey, Hotshot. <laughs> Effuse phosphorescent golden boy, impatient candle. The far end of your radiant hues are huge. Your good mood pearls away gloom. Hot tempered god, always a charmer. Abide anything as long as there is light. Well, hello, ladies. <laughs> Tawny and tussled, within every charismatic waits a hateful flare. You flirt. Cliché in a clinch. Too hot to touch. Touché. Glorious morning means you're long gone, summer, sol summer solstice. The light of the sun falls equally on everything. Matter eater lad. <laughs> Super digestion. <laughs> Anyone back there feels awkward laughing at something like Matter Eater Lad? No, please. Yeah, be my guest. <laughs> You'd be surprised how useful it is to find everything to your taste. <laughs> he can keep anything down. Consumer of malice or metal or miracle, even magnezite, the most poisonous metal in the galaxy, his gullet's furious furnace. Matter Eater Lad can turn anything into more Matter Eater Lad. <laughs> Waste not, want not, smart mouth, flatly palatable. Are you going to eat that? <laughs> This is Pharaoh Lad, who was the first legionnaire to die in battle. Our humble human shield, almost equal to his anxiety. Armor up, son. Annihilated iron gone to gas, superheated, engulfed Gollum. His exit a glory flourish, foolish, or a guaranteed goner who went well. Statue who moves, every gesture hewn, his sheer mask metallic. Mirror chrome, under which an ugly boy, befanged beneath. And this is Shadow Lass. Know first that there are some things from which you cannot hide. If your eyes widen, unwilled, she's oblivious to others, their taint and tint. Terror's tourney in her irradiant radius, blue-black beckoner. Her ink, absolute blue, unthinking. Ladle out the shade, that peculiar Spartan darkness, womb warm, unwitnessed, little miss mysterious. Simple as anti-sun, yet subtle as gas. Ask our shadow lass, are shadows shadowless? This is Gadget Catalog, one of a series of poems that describes the future. It's Earth Day today, I think, yes? Yes. yes. Now that we know that there is not going to be a future, uh, I think the idea of a utopian 30th century takes on a certain poignance. <clears throat> Your comfort will be secured by fusion power spheres for which there is no black market. 
How often will be spoken the words, prepare the ray cannon? <laughs> you will visit the Cary Interplanetary Library and rifle through its dusty hollow tapes. This is worldwide 3D news, the ultimate road vehicle, the Astrovet 8000. You will be rewarded for your heroism with all forms of intergalactic species, including the metal eating beasts of Rojan. For every nature, it's opposite. The visiphone, the crime computer, molecular glue guns, anti telepathy helmets, battery beds. Plastic hasps and medikits, detention spheres and mento scanners. Rip rays to shear through steel, anti-tron guns, retro rifles and solar stunners, amalgamite refineries, energo shields. But don't forget the miracle machine sitting in your basement. It turns thoughts into reality. Don't think about it. Similarly, Crime and Punishment. Volume 9 features Klim, the synthetic criminal with his Zootronic brain. <laughs> Glacier Point, one more round of psychic rehabilitation for you. Lethal, the Freedom of Behavior Act. The science police request assistance on Takron Galthos. Science police device, the interrogator. My ultra-sensitive probes reveal your innermost thoughts. You cannot deceive me. My truth value indicator prohibits it. Encephalo detector, disinter criminals, disinter recidivists, interpret risk. On Labyrinth, we buried them. This is the super stylag of space. It is a retelling of the very first comic book I ever bought. Actually, I half bought it. My sister owns the other half, but she drew in it, so. <laughs> Damn her. <clears throat> the warden, either Nardo or Naldo, desires the traitor made naked. It's true of a type. It's a prison planet for superheroes, but the goggle-eyed guards sequester heroines in separate pens. The warden is running out of teens to torture. Under such pressure, who wouldn't crack? The warden tried unspooling Brainiac's brain, but how hard can that be? His blonde forelock unlocked. Him, the green boy cried. It's him! Named the traitor. Named their terror. And the gayest superhero in the United Planets left around the barracks like a weightless thing, which, weight wizard, he was. <laughs> he sprang on thighs, coiled against gravity, purple and white, the orchid blur of him. Such a man to make even brainy look macho, fled into floral fields and for fuck's sake lily pads. <laughs> One of which opened its carnal, vulval, unsubtle, and ate him up. <laughs> Tragic, but also a warning. Oh, warden, we just wanted to teach that spring-heeled sissy a lesson in uber-heroics. Meanwhile, Matter Eater Lad is the tunnel king of this prison narrative, matter eater cheek full of stone, struck down on the other side of the fence. It looks like curtains for the kids. When rescue comes via some accident involving beams bouncing off my invincible chest, matter eater lad will conclude as punitively fat, and of all these penal, it is Superboy and mon -El who return to wreak vengeance. Lean on us. Fattened heroes, filthy heroes, brainwashed and bullied and bunk bedded these long weeks. They append and suffix us with boy, but we are men. <laughs> this is the weddings that wrecked the Legion. <clears throat> Has Brainiac 5 finally flipped his lid? He's nattering on about Plan R. What's Plan R? But Phantom Girl and Ultra Boy are noodling and nuzzling. Brainy is peeves to say the least. Saturn Girl steps in. He respects her. But she's sweet on Lightning Lad. Paired lovers moon about the museum. Only you stood up for me, Phantom Girl. How could you ever love a boy with a robot arm? <laughs> Unbeknownst to all secret agents, watch and listen and wonder, what is Plan R? They kidnap Saturn Girl, and su uh, who summons Lightning Lad. Seeing suddenly how empty life would be without her, Garth proposes, and Ember says yes, and then they quit. Just like that. 
for there are rules in the Legion Code, and these are they. Ultra Boy and Phantom Girl follow suit. Four Legionnaires lost. You thought Brainy was out of sorts before. Holy cats. <laughs> your cold, your cold emotional computer, your cold emotionless computer mind can't comprehend what love is. <laughs> Et tu, Saturn girl? Still, she's sorry. But Brainiac 5 just rolls his eyes and seeks to fill the ranks, and the secret agents think, hey, a quick super disguise, and then it's Size Lad, Blackout Boy, Magnetic Kid. Meanwhile, Mana was missing the others. Adventures and events commence, and then the inevitable switcheroo. Plan R uncovered, but in code. Really, Saturn Girl and Brainy were in on it the whole time. It's like Shakespeare, weddings, and order restored. Brainiac notes that since the chaplain was a robot, the weddings are actually fake. <laughs> Quick thinking, Brainiac 5. But now Garth and Imra and Joe and Tinya have had a taste. The clock's ticking. See, Brainiac, that's the problem. You're always giving them ideas. <laughs> This is Invisible Kids. Seen not believed, then unseen and just so. Let us recollect Lyle, resurrect Lyle, and savor his serum, every lie from his lips tasting the solution for sight, his girl suspended between dimension. The scene's so insufficient to see through the water cupped in your translucent palm or through the sea's strata to the ocean floor. Invisible boys share uncommon colors, a burden upon which they merely agree. To fall asleep or die is Lyle Norg's second best trick. When he closes his eyes, everyone else disappears. Memory of our second smartest, our Earth's offer, our best. Memory disreputes nostalgia. The second invisible kid shares with his predecessor an error that the mess of the world maintains when we erase our gaze. Any one star almost missing, flirtatious as fractions. Invisibility acts on reason, not sense or faith, not the invisible body's crude guesses. Lyle's lies invisible. Stories, proof of love, justice, judgment, the very most essence invisible. Home movies of the original Invisible Kid. Motes of dust twirl, action rattles on the screen. Much unclear, much unclear occurs. The recollection of the Invisible Kid means to gather again in your arms what cannot be believed. Events set like sheets of glass, smoothly one atop the next. Serum seen in the glass. It shines printless, no character yet. The memory of drink, dear and inadequate as holographs of dead lovers and dead legionnaires. Concoction of perfect clarity, contained, dumb to itself, real, unreal, picture and a lapse, detail lost to deterioration, opaque snow fallen to water in invisible hands, their motion, illusion, absent memories remain. Where are you, invisible kid? Blind, we ask the obvious. Once there was a boy, then there was not, then there was. Brainiac 5 drops the plot. <clears throat> He's a super genius, but he loses his mind on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> Surprise. <coughs> Once I got a mind full of psychoactive preparation L. As the potent chemicals assault the reason of Brainiac 5's mighty mind, my mind was bent to tell you of bodies changed into other bodies. My privacy was violated. I am always doing this. I never do this. Whatever inside you that is moved by other than mind is also your mind. The lizard that lurks in your brain's thirds and threads becomes the action of your body, which in its living becomes everything abhorrent and necessary. One year it's God's gone bad, and the next year it's science gone bad, and the next year it's you. As Murrah flings her hands up in petition, but, though slowed, it still grows. Or as a tiger unfolds herself into leisure, but still fills herself with man. Mind of sap or mind of lightning. My mind is bent to tell you of your body made into other bodies. I do not understand what you do not understand is the perfect sentence, even though the perfect sentence is also the perfect sentence. 
Because my grip on life is less than tight, I bequeath unto you your own nature. Because gods were animals, and the wits of animals are animals still, their limbs, their fingers, their tongues, and tails. In rending, I render. I always, I never. And I will finish with this. It's called Sense Maps of the United Planets. And these are all worlds that have uh, spawned teens who went on to become legionnaires. <laughs> <coughs> Brawl. At dawn, wasp rings pucker the binding force. Oh, these iron beasts beset us, Lord. Their horns and ferrous filings. Let us make magnetic. Repulse and click. Settlers electro-weft woven. Disheveled whineth and her lightning crows. The labor of the sheaves forever undone, rain abraded. Your perfect granaries and gametes, twin androgenes all and freckled. Titan, imperial strokes as strud, horizons loom at your windows and adept your offspring bathe in one mind. Severe sexes of Titan, regal preserve of privacy, moon fingers picking apart pathogens. Ales and alleys of Rimbor, ink parlors and whores, chromatic bouquet. Evening scent lays Rimbor suspended between doorframe and city scene. Scoundrels. Earth. Boyd in a polymer screen, the planet's prophylactic. Seven sprawling cities and whole continents preserved for parks. Diplomatically diverse. Capital planet. Naltor that dreams. Mercurial moldings and sleep sweat in which precognition glistens. Your pillows and parted lips. Platinum and probable. Come to bed with us. Krypton. Buckled under her own majestic freight, organless at the end, adorned over every inch, mathematical maternities, crack wombed, dead of her delivery. Little sister Daxam. God hands tucked in surgeon's gloves, engineers of immature. The pristine garden cultures of Daxam shattered. Her surgeons seedling spread throughout the world, done in by base, exiled to airlessness. Karg, multiplicative. We're fashioning shutters into thirds. Subtle schizophrenia, always boxes shaking loose of boxes, mirrorless but mindful. The anachronisms of Orando, craggy king and stony castle, ungoverned reigns, monarchial and matter-of-fact, suit of armor and shield, standing in every able man's house. Infinitesimal imps' shrinking season. Transport for tourists, the giant's architecture, transpiring even now. Perspective here, burgeons and billows, falling down world, misplaced, minor. Begitzel which is barely. Phantom phase shifted to mist, export of black and ashy in tangerines, begitzel, which passes through you, which eludes. Call you is a sleep negation, flesh impatient for curved corridors, hypercognitive and ageless, supreme intellect of call you, instinct unsubstantiated in your city circuits. Decays of Tolok IV, that dwindle to gases. Chalk blue heroines, nocturne tuned and martial, dwellers in cliffs set against dwellers of the plains, effacing shades, your unlight, your curious dark. Xerox, sorcerer's world, imaginary, continents shimmer and drip, slither and blink. All illusion, inheritable errors, rock wreathed in gaseous, ever unfolding and uncertain. Durla, about which everything. Clans and cults and custom, rigid for the regulation of pure shape, molten membership, irradiated and ruined fluid. The changelings, forbidden this place, soil face, an ovum ocean and murdered Trom, pillage for plunder, leadened and leavened, alchemical legend, lost monks and lost meditations, empty of elementals, 
Her seas shout. Her salts foam and form. Salt of her seas follows suit. Thank you. Mark Wonderlich's poetry is bodily embodied. He explores the tangle of the body's irrational desires unflinchingly with a disarming earnestness and fine-tuned sense of beauty. His poems explore the nuances of physical encounters, encounters between human bodies, between human bodies and animal bodies, between the human body and its own fragility. His first book, um, The Anchorage, won the Lambda Literary Award. Uh, the word anchorage can mean either a safe place for a ship to anchor or the residence of an anchorite, which was a religious vocation in the Middle Ages. Anchorites chose to undergo symbolic death and be sealed into a small chamber attached to a church where they spent the rest of their lives in solitary prayer and contemplation. Um, Mark Wunderlich's poems seem to issue from an intimate voice in a small, quiet space, someone whispering to you in the dark. They are both complex and piercing, with both a depth of recollection suggesting distance, time, and meditation, and at the same time, an immediate clarity of image. From poem to poem, the scene may be rural, urban, or a bedroom, populated by sheep, or drag queens, or two lovers excavating their obscure desires, but Mark Wunderlich has an enviable ability to address everything in his wide range of subject matter with an equalizing grace and tenderness. An injured deer crawling off the road into a ditch in difficult body, a muscular, dominant lover asking for a kiss in the trick, or a son firing a gun for the first time under his father's stern eye in the shot. His second book, Voluntary Servitude, is full of the same grace. Scenes of sexual dominance and submission are interwoven with natural and rural imagery, especially animals both wild and domestic. Snakes appear again and again, by turns threatening, repulsive, and supernatural. In Lamb, the speaker pulls twin lambs out of their mother with bare hands, then admits, they will come when I call, press against woven wire, even though I call them to the gleaming hook. In Tamed, he describes the frustrating ongoing process of taming a horse to wear a saddle, a seeming parallel to obedience attempts in which a submissive partner threatens to rebel against the dominant, only to reaffirm the latter's control. As one line in Voluntary Servitude's title poem reads, to see a man in shackles, how you feel about that depends on whether the service is voluntary. The hands that gently extract the newborn lambs also threaten them with violence. This poetry lives in the tension between sovereignty and submission, between suffering and desire, between nurturing and violence. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Wunderlich. Thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I've been hearing about this, this place in Michigan, uh, here at the Dharma Center, for as long as I've known Sarah. And um, it's really moving, actually, to be here with her. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really happy to share this stage with Ray and Monica as well. I'm going to be reading uh, poems from a new, from a book in progress, from a new manuscript, um, and uh, the the book is is forthcoming, and it's uh, called "The Earth of Veils." This first poem I'll read is called "Wamandy," which is the name of a town in uh, rural western Wisconsin near where I grew up, and it's a, a small town, not known for much of anything except its population of albino deer. So, <laughs> Wamandy. How's the volume, by the way? Can you hear? Okay. A man with binoculars fixed a shape in the field, and we stopped and saw the albino buck browsing in the oats. White dash on a page of green, 
flick of a blade cutting paint to canvas. It dipped its head and green effaced the white, bled onto the absence that the buck was, animal erasure. Head up again, its sugar legs pricked the turf, pink antler prongs brushed at flies. Here in a field was the imagined world made visible, a mythical beast filling its rumen with clover, until all at once it startled, flagged its bright tail, auf Wiedersehen, surrender, and leapt away, a white tooth in the closing mouth of the woods. A number of the poems in this new manuscript are based on a, a 19th century uh, book of prayers um, that I found when I was uh, home visiting my parents. And it was written, it was published in um, 1870 in St. Louis. It was written in German and uh, it was uh, a, a part of a, 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 a prayer book uh, for the Lutheran church. And this, I understand this was once a Lutheran barn. Um, and uh, what impressed me about the book was its specificity, uh, the specificity of the concerns of the prayers um, and their, their earnestness. Um, so I've, I've written a number of poems that are based on, that, that have the same title as some of those prayers. Uh, this one is called A Servant's Prayer. O oh, tender-hearted, O oh, kind-hearted, you who have spared us from eternal servitude by torturing and killing your only child, we know what you can do. Only you can spare us from a world in which the creature presses his stinking hoof to our neck, the tyrant who supervises a petty bureaucracy rich with oil and other filth, covers his sow bride's fat Bahama tanned paw with a crust of diamonds. <laughs> you have chosen to keep me in a state of service, beholden to a mustachioed czarina, isolated and confused and grandiose, which is, I confess, a trial. I beg you, assuage my bitterness. Help me to know that this is your will and keep me from resenting those who, despite their meager talents, their pettiness and appetite for derision, wield power over me. My service here, though of this world, is not meant for this world, bent on uglification and strife. Part the curtain and let me glimpse your gleaming hem. Remind me that behind this knotted tapestry of tasks and humiliations lies a shining world that must remain hidden so it may remain unspoiled. When Misty severed her thumb and wrapped it in a swaddle of cloth, afraid to tell management lest she lose her job, I glimpsed you there at the pearly bone flush with crimson, beautiful and fragile and lit with the pain of our kind. At the hospital, she was made whole, though I am certain she bears the scar to this day. And you were secreted once again beneath the surgeon's arrogant work. I am grateful for the power in my body. Help guard it from poisons, keep my sleeve far from the spinning shaft, my skin free from tick bites, stray dogs, the mule's ivory teeth. Help me keep my strength and practice diligence and mercy like your son, sawing and swinging his hammer, walking home on dusty feet to a meal someone worked all morning to prepare. This next poem is a, about a cat, and um, I understand completely that when you start writing poems about your cats, you're on thin ice, but um, <laughs> when the muse calls, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> cat lying in the grass. 
He would lie in the grass, belly down, needled paws poised to take their prey, which was which more often than not was large, grouse or rabbit kit, blue jay, mole, vole, or bat. He left the snakes alone to dream in the haymow, eyes dusty with sun. The dogs would, if young and stupid, follow him in the yard, keeping a distance until, reluctantly, it seemed, he'd burst from a crouch to shred their soft ears. We shared territory in a state of truce, three pastures, two yards, barn, shed, and stable, the sheep pens, outer edges of the sty, marsh and forest and house in which he'd sleep away the daylight. Once he split the nose of a curious woman who foolishly turned to see what wildness tore at the back of her chair. He was impossible to punish. A husband's prayer. You, author of all wonders, shown to us by your many prophets and instruments, our own shoemaker's daughter, illiterate and bent, who proclaims from her special chair in the meeting house, who reminds us to be humble and not aspire above our station, to find beauty in utility and to beware idolatry, you who chose to provide me with a spouse and a house, a barn and sheds, gardens, a small orchard, a field rich with clover, hives humid and speckled with pollen, and who finds the greatest satisfaction when we attend to three responsibilities, to be a brother to another, to be a good and kindly neighbor, to move through the world with a mate. Give me strength. From the coolest and boggiest portion of my heart, my worries multiply as spores canker the apple leaf. My mate, though weak, is there to help me set aside my burdens. If only I could describe them into the space between our pillows at night. When thistles spring up in the field, when the noxious vine twines onto the maple, let us pull it up by its roots. When I gaze upon the Gothic script tattooed on the young gardener's brown stomach, strain to read it as it folds, remind me my own name is written in the mind of another, however faint. Let that be enough. Let me not dwell on our weaknesses, on our smells, our shedding skin and hair. There is a small chalet somewhere on the cool green pasture of an alp where we shelter, our heads on the striped ticking, our hands barely touching as we sleep. Uh, this poem is for Travin. Where's Travin? He's here somewhere. Opening the hive. Suited and veiled to see the queen, I bruise the air with smoke. It puffs from its billow, the punk wood and cowhorn sumac I put in it to burn, stun the city of sunlight that is the hive. I am married to them, for they are one thing, body in the shape of a box, body in bits flung to the sky, or sipping water and nectar with the tensile proboscis used to clean and suck that once groomed the queen when she was still foreign and caged in her box of wire and candy. She was womb without a body, heart without a head, and now she is their castle keep, calling her progeny who scour the world for flowers. They have built their comb and attend their young, have stored away in clammy cells, antiseptic, condensed, essence of shepherd's purse and grape. 
They cluster around their monarch, lighting the air with prudence and with rage. A visitor was recently stung. She stood too close, blocked a worker's path, and a bee collided with her head, struck her on the arch of her brow. I flicked away the stinger, licked a penny, and held it to the spot. The hurt of it moved around her face, and the eyes swelled shut from the barb of life torn from the body of the bee. Here are a couple more animal poems. This one is called Ram. He stands stamping in the pasture, angry that I've come, angry that I didn't come sooner with my pail of grain. Top notch of wool shields his eyes, snagged with bits of hay, bunched with burrs. He shakes his head, flares nostrils under a Roman nose, curls a lip to show me his single row of teeth like keys of a harpsichord, long, ivory yellow, pegged in a black gum. In snow, he'll stand all day by the hay feeder, fleece parting at the spine, grease saving him from the worst of it, staring into the source of the weather. In April, the shearing team will come and tip him on his rump, ridding him of a year's worth of wool. He'll submit to the indignity, fleece peeled back in flocculent rolls. Back on all fours, he'll trot off to find his flock, sniff his harem's bare behinds, account for his many lambs that nurse desperately, confused by their mother's altered forms. They call and call while he remains calm, stepping among his kind, assessing the newly naked. Once he knocked me down with a blow to my hip, 300 pounds and a thick skull crashed against my pelvis. Sprawled in the mud and dung, I pulled myself through straw while he backed up for another run. Before he could, I hit him with a broken rail, cracked it across his nose. He barely noticed. <laughs> now he regards me with golden ovine eyes, rich with a pastoral flame. Read one of a different kind. This is another animal poem, but I realized that the animal things don't turn out so well for a lot of the animals in these poems. So I think maybe you ought to we'll mix it up a little bit. Oh, and there's another one too. see. Look at me from your pitiless distance. Look as I give myself to the feral sea, where I hang between atmosphere and the hidden sands below. Your fool in this plaything of a boat, which may no longer save nor salvage. See me here, face in my hands, wet with spray and sweat, sick with the knowledge of my unworthiness. The wind pitches, waves break where they will, neither soil nor stone beneath me, while overhead the dumb sky strips off its wet shirt and tosses it to the wind's hands. I beg you, push up my chin with your thumb and press your bearded cheek to mine. Settle me with the dark soil of your eyes, you who made us and all the other pieces of the damaged world. What we men offer each other is nothing 
compared to your cold body lying down atop my own, prostrate on the deck, your breath humid in my ear. Last night, I dreamt the ship grew down and pinions, a hard and rubbery bill, while the prow shook itself into the neck of a swan. I clung to its back like a louse, and we flew, feet drawn up into feathers, the glacier of night creeping by beneath us. I have forsworn all the others, feel you tightening me to your large thighs, nothing left to keep us apart. I am your little ram, burying his muzzle in the thick grass of your pasture, folded by you at night, herded by day, a dedicated dog nipping at my hocks. The day will come for you to draw the bright sickle of the moon across my woolly throat. Do it with love, without regret. <laughs>